Now we're continuing our study on divorce and remarriage, and this is the beginning of the third tape. We've come a long way, and so if you haven't got the first two, you need to be sure and listen to those first two tapes, which lays the background for where we are at this point. We began at Deuteronomy chapter 24 and verse 1, and then I uh, began to teach what the Old Testament writing of a bill of divorcement was, and actually read uh, a real-life Jewish divorcement bill, and ex went over some things there. Then we went on into the New Testament with Matthew chapter 5, Matthew chapter 19, Mark chapter number 10, Luke chapter number 16, and bounce back briefly to the book of uh, Leviticus and Deuteronomy, and just briefly cover the scriptures in Malachi. And um, at this point, we are now in our view of the church fathers. We took a break a little while from the scriptures, and then we're going to go back to the scriptures and get 1 Timothy chapter 3 in just a little bit. So you want to stay with us now and finish listening to these tapes. And I imagine that uh, we probably lost some listeners back an hour or two ago. And when we got to preaching on some things that a lot of folks are guilty of. But, you know, when a man has truth to back up what he says, he don't have to get mad. And I'll tell you something else. He can sit and listen to another person and then listen and check it out by the book. You mark these people that always get mad and slam their fists down as one Christian brother was talking to another about these matters and he was talking to him and, and he said, but brother, the Bible says, and the brother says, I don't care what the Bible says. Now you mark a man like that. You know what a man's problem is that talks like that? He's wrong. The man who gets mad usually is the man who's wrong and knows it, but he's scared or ashamed to admit it. Now, what I'm trying to do is help people to understand the truth of what the Bible says. We're not trying to make anybody a leeway to sin, but we're also not trying to be pharisaical, condemn everybody that's not been as fortunate as we have been. So we're right in the middle of some quotes from the church historians, church fathers, and reformers. And we just got through giving you one on the last tape by Martin Luther in the 1500s when he said he marveled that the Romans wouldn't allow remarriage of a man separated from his wife by divorce but compelled him to remain single. And he talked about Christ allowing remarriage because of fornication. That was Martin Luther in the 1600s. Now, I am not saying I agree with all these men on their doctrine. I'm not saying that at all. The purpose of me giving you this quote is that we have a strange idea among some uh, country preachers today that nobody ever believed this until the last few years and that what I'm teaching you about divorce and remarriage is simply that we are backslid and we're giving in to the pressure of this age and all great men of God down through the ages taught that nobody could ever be remarried after they've been divorced. That's a bunch of baloney and I'm proving that on these days. Here's more proof coming up. 1860, from the writings of Philip Schaff's Creeds of Christendom, published by Harper in 1877, two, page 229, he says this, By the law of nature, the marriage tie is not indissoluble. That means a marriage can be dissolved. That's from the 1860s and the 1870s. Now, listen to this question. Listen to this statement from the Archbishop of Canterbury. Listen to what he says on 1 Corinthians 7, 15. Let me say quite frankly, I'm quoting him now, that in some cases where a first marriage has ended in tragedy, a second marriage has, by every test of the presence of the Holy Spirit that we are able to recognize, been abundantly blessed. For this very reason, I do not find myself able to forbid good people who come to me for advice to embark on a second marriage. That's from Problems of Marriage and Divorce from the Archbishop of Canterbury. And not, uh, the book was published in 1955. Now, you know what? That man said a mouthful there. I didn't know that man. I don't know what he believes about other things, but he sure said a mouthful there, brother. He said, It is very evident that God is blessing and using and has his hand on some people in their second marriage. 
Now, anybody with any spiritual discernment at all and an open heart and mind couldn't deny that statement. You know as well as I know some of the most dedicated, hardest working, soul winning individuals you've ever met in your life are people that are in their second marriage. I'll tell you, we've got several folks that had an unfortunate marriage experience maybe before they got saved or right when they first got saved. and we're, They've been some of the hardest workers in our church. They love God. They pray. They fast. Some of them are in their second marriage. They're soul winners. One man in our church just recently brought, I don't know how many visitors to the church, seeing them saved right and left, winning people to God. And then you got others sitting back criticizing him that haven't brought anybody to church with them in six months claiming this man's living in adultery. And something don't add up there somewhere. Um, this, let me give you this quote again from this archbishop. Quote, Let me say quite frankly that in some cases where a first marriage has ended in tragedy, and it is a tragedy, a second marriage has, by every test of the presence of the Holy Spirit that we are able to recognize, been abundantly blessed for this very reason, the very fact he knows that the Holy Spirit is blessing their home and marriage, I do not find myself able to forbid good people who come to me for advice to embark on a second marriage. Let me give you another quote from 1877 from Philip Schaff's Creeds of Christendom, and it's on volume 3, page 656. Quote, Adultery and fornication dissolve the marriage and the innocent party has the right to marry another as if the offending party were dead. Now that settles it as far as uh, what he believed about it, doesn't it? He didn't say that when that person married again they had two living husbands or two living wives. He said adultery and fornication dissolved that marriage just the same as the offending party were dead. Now, if a man's wife died and he married again, you wouldn't say he had two wives, would you? Sure, I mean, there might be some people say that, but I, I don't think most Christians, with any sense at all, I'd say 99% probably of Christians wouldn't say that if a man's wife died he'd had, and he married again, he'd had two wives. And so adultery and fornication dissolve that marriage just the same as if the, the offending party, the guilty one of adultery, was dead. And as far as that innocent party is concerned, he is just as free as if that adulterous mate had died. And that's backed up by the scripture. It's backed up by common sense, by the law of the land, by the church historians. And there is no evidence in history, Bible, dictionary, or common sense to teach that a man whose mate commits adultery and breaks his marriage, that that man has to remain single the rest of his life. All right, let's give you some more. John Wesley in the 1700s, this is a, com a compend of Wesley's theology, page 238 from Abingdon Press. I'm quoting John Wesley now. It is adultery for any man to marry again unless that divorce has been for the cause of adultery. In that only case, there is no scripture which forbids to marry again. Now, that was a smart fellow, you know it? I mean, I mean, John Wesley, in John Wesley's day, they weren't uh, brainwashed by society. They didn't have the, the uh, television and soap operas and, and uh, HBO and Cinemax and Showtime and the MTV and the uh, Sweden atmosphere everywhere. I mean, John Wesley was a man that loved God with all his heart. And he said it's adultery for a man to marry again unless that divorce has been for the cause of adultery. And that's what we can't seem to get through people's head these days. They have this idea that if you say it's all right for a person to get married again, you're saying it's all right for anybody that wants to to get a divorce and get married again. That's not what we're saying. That's not what the Bible said. The Bible says this, and John Wesley said this, that it's wrong for a man to get married again unless his, was, his divorce was for the cause of adultery. And, of course, that hits the nail on the head. That's exactly our position uh, from the teaching of Matthew 
19, and of course we go on later to 1 Corinthians 7, as we already have a little bit ago. How about this? Charles Spurgeon in the 1800s. That was a great man, I reckon, ain't it? Quote, Marriage is for life and cannot be loosed except by the one great crime. Notice how every one of these fellows gives the exception. The one great crime which severs its bond, that cuts that rope I've been talking to you about, a woman divorced for any cause but adultery and marrying again is committing adultery before God. Charles Spurgeon said it exactly like Wesley said. He said if a, if a woman just gets divorced and marries another, it's wrong. But if she does it for adultery, it is not wrong. All right. From the bishops that Origen told about in the third century all the way up through the Middle Ages to Martin Luther to John Wesley to Charles uh, Haddon Spurgeon. And let me give you one more quote here from John Calvin. And of course, I, I'm, I'm not a Calvinist, and I'm sure most of you aren't, but you got to admit John Calvin was a, a bright and shining light in his day and even though he was messed up on some of his doctrine, he was a, a smart theologian. And he said this, quote, An adulterous wife cuts herself off as a rotten member of the marriage. It is the duty of the husband to purge his house from infamy. By committing adultery, he, the husband, has dissolved the marriage. The wife is set at liberty. Now we see down through the Middle Ages to Martin Luther, to John Calvin, to John Wesley, to Charles Spurgeon, a long and impressive list of names in Christianity that believed that divorce for unfaithfulness dissolved the marriage and allowed the right of remarriage. There is no scripture in the Bible that says a person divorced for fornication or deserted by and maliciously deserted and, and divorced by an unbelieving mate cannot remarry. You say, well, what about that scripture over there in Malachi, Brother Danny, where it said, The Lord God of Israel hateth putting away. You can go back there and read that scripture. Don't take it out of context. It said there in Malachi uh, chapter 2, I believe that scripture is in verse uh, 14, 15, and 16, he said, Because the Lord hath been witness against thee and the wife of thy youth against whom thou hast dealt treacherously. There's the key. For the Lord, the God of Israel, saith that he hateth putting away. The putting away that God was speaking of in Malachi chapter 2 was where those Jews were being cruel. They were divorcing their wives for just any reason at all. They had no grounds. They had no right. They just got tired of looking at her and wanted them another woman. And God said, I hate it. He always has hated it. He still hates it to now, even though it's going on in Hollywood. That is what you call dealing against the wife of your youth, youth treacherously. I challenge you, show me a verse in the Bible where God said he hates it if it's for fornication. Amen? Make sure you understand the Bible. Don't ever, ever, ever read something into the Scripture that's not there. All right, now I'm going to read you a little bit um, of Dr. John R. Rice's book. Now, again, and, uh, and where these people were writing him letters, and, you know, they always wrote him letters asking him questions, and he would give his advice. Here again, I say I'm not, I'm not saying I agree with these fellows on everything, even on this subject. I'm just giving you support from what I said about uh, this doctrine didn't just pop up in the last 20 years. Dr. John R. Rice was asked the question, quote, now listen to the way this woman talks and sounds just like somebody from this part of the country. If a born-again woman, this is the person writing to Dr. Rice, has two living mates, divorced from one, married to another, is it permissible for her to hold an office in the church, such as Sunday school teacher, woman's group leader, and so on? That's the question. Here's Dr. Rice's answer. Quote, In the first place, you are using unscriptural language and an unscriptural idea in talking about a woman having two living mates. In Bible language, as you see in Deuteronomy 24, 1 to 4, one would be her former husband and one would be her husband. When a woman is divorced and left her husband, 
then that man is not now her husband. It is true that the marriage ought not to have been broken, but still in such case the marriage is broken. Listen to what he said in answer to another question. Then after divorce, she is no longer the first husband's wife. He is now her former husband, not her husband according to the language of Deuteronomy 24. And so now that she is not married, she is free to marry, of course, only in the Lord. Listen to this question. Quote, this is the question now to Dr. Rice. Do you think a pastor should not marry if either of the couple has been divorced? And also that he should not marry a couple if one has been born again and the other is not. And of course, you know the answer to the second question. We're not here discussing saint, uh, married, uh, marrying saved people and lost people. I'm sure we'd all agree that that shouldn't be. But the question mainly is if one of the couple has been divorced and talking about the pastor marrying them. Here's what he says. Quote, about divorced people, as I understand the scriptures, there is only one reason that makes a divorce legitimate and right, and that is fornication or continued adultery. Let us say that if a woman has gone into a life of harlotry, fornication, her husband would be justified in divorcing her, according to Matthew 5 and Matthew 19. It seems clear from these words of Jesus that he regards a marriage as already broken in such a case. So if I personally know the people and know that the divorced person had a scriptural right to divorce, I would feel free to marry them. I would not feel free, however, to marry somebody on their own word if I did not know the circumstances or have good evidence about it. Thus, I generally would not marry divorced people if I did not know them well and know the circumstances. But I ought to say also that even if the divorce were granted and on, not on scriptural grounds, and later one of the party married and continued living with the other mate, that would break the marriage on the same basis as fornication and would set the other person free as I understand the scripture. If a couple is divorced and one of them is remarried, there is no possibility of restoring the first marriage, then the divorce has really taken place as recognized by God and society. Divorce is bad, but sometimes a wrong cannot be undone. One can get forgiveness for sin that cannot be corrected. If you kill a man, you can get forgiveness, but you cannot bring back the man to life, and so it is sometimes with a home that is broken irretrievably. I know that there is a great deal of difference of opinion on this matter of divorce. Some people do not make the exceptions which Jesus himself made in Matthew 5 and Matthew 19, and so they do not think one ought to have a divorce for any reason, or they do not understand that the word divorce means, both in our language and in the Bible, that a divorced person is unmarried and therefore has a right to marry. I say good men differ, and I do not criticize them sharply for difference of opinion, which is honest. That's from Dr. John R. Rice. And uh, what he was saying there is if uh, another one, one of the, mate, the married couple goes out and uh, divorces and marries someone else, it sets the other person free to marry whom they will. We got a, uh, some folks, not very many, have a strange teaching nowadays that if you are in your second marriage, that you can never, ever, ever be right with God until you leave that mate. And you see what the devil's doing, don't you? The devil is using them to break up people's homes. Two wrongs don't make a right, friend. And you're just as guilty as the person who broke the first home for breaking that second home. God Almighty recognized the legitimacy of the second marriage in Deuteronomy 24 so much that he wouldn't even let that woman go back and marry her first husband. You say, oh, that was Moses' word. But who do, who do you think inspired Moses to write it? The Holy Ghost did for the hardness of their hearts. To break a second marriage wouldn't help the first one. And another scandal, break another heart, tear up children. You set little children down and tell them, Mom and Daddy's going to separate and, get, and not live together no more because God tells us to. Now, what's a kid like that going to think about a God that tells his mom and dad to separate. 
Oh, boy, I tell you, there's going to be some people answer for some things one of these days. There is no scripture in the Bible that tells a person in their second marriage that they're supposed to separate. Even if their first marriage was broken on unscriptural ground, it's over and done. The best thing to do is pray for forgiveness, ask forgiveness for breaking the first marriage, and stay in the situation you're in and make the best out of it and try to do something for God the best you can. Now, we've been plowing for a good while now, and we're coming right along, and we give you evidence from church history and evidence from church fathers Martin Luther, John Wesley, Charles Spurgeon, right on up, men like Dr. John R. Rice, Dr. John Rollins, Dr. Jack Hiles, and many, 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 Dr. Bob Gray, many, 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 many more that we could just name. And, and I, I, I don't want to involve a lot of people in this, but I'm sure these men would tell you, if you call them and ask them how they feel about this subject. All right. We'll now go back to the scripture, and for a little while we'll take the next blockbuster in this study, and that is, of course, 1 Timothy chapter 3. Now, in 1 Timothy chapter 3, we run into the scripture that people use, uh, and what they do is they take out a verse, part of a verse in second, or 1 Timothy chapter 3, interpret it into a twisted view of Romans 7, and then try to tell you if a man's ever been married twice, he can't be a preacher or a deacon. Here we go. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1. This is a true saying, that if a man desire the office of a bishop, make sure you get that, office. It's not a calling. A bishop is not, you're not called to be a bishop. You're appointed by the church and called. It's an office. Amen? Your man's called to the ministry. He's called to preach, and he's called to do something for God, but a church chooses their pastor. That word bishop, overseer. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. Now, let me tell you something. If a church chooses a man to be their pastor, and that local church has chosen that man to be their pastor, and that's the man they want, and they're happy with them, you know something? It ain't none of mine in your business. If we're, and you got a lot of these little Protestant popes running around trying to say who's qualified and who's not qualified. And this man, boy, I'd, I'd hate to look into some of their, you know, some of those situations. You reckon their kids are always under subjection? You reckon they meet all the qualifications in First Timothy chapter 3? Well, let's look at it. Verse 2, a bishop then must be blameless. Now, of course, uh, that don't mean perfect. You understand that. It means he can't be a scandaler and a rascal and run around getting in trouble. He's got to have a testimony. The husband of one wife. Now, here we go. You say, now, Brother Danny, as far as I'm concerned, what that, that scripture means that, if a man, that a man can only be married one time. Well, you know, you're entitled to your opinion, but that's not what it says. It says husband of one wife. You say, what do you think it means? I think it means what it says. You've got to be the husband of one wife. Is that, you don't have to, we're not interested in what you think it means. We want to know what does the book say. The book says you've got to be the husband of one wife, married to one woman. It means exactly what it says. Somebody asked me one time, they said, what do you think that means? I said, it means what it says. And they said, what are you talking about? I said, it means you're supposed to be the husband of one wife. You're supposed to be married to one woman. If a man's married to two women, he's not to be have that office of a bishop. All the way through the Old Testament. They didn't have the New Testament except just part of it during this time. All the way through the Old Testament, men had multiple wives. In 1 Samuel 25, in Deuteronomy 17, 17. Let's look at that scripture over there just a second. Deuteronomy chapter 17 and verse 17. Now, I, I can hear some of you uh, right now, and boy, you're just steams are coming out of your ears, and you're saying, boy, he's te te teaching heresy. He believes a man can just marry and divorce and marry and divorce and marry and divorce all the times he wants to. I ain't saying that. 
That's demons talking to you if you think that, brother. I'm just saying what the Bible says. I'm saying what the Bible says. You can't, you can't prove this is wrong. I'm saying what the book says. You want to read about two wives? Look at Deuteronomy 17, 17, when, they're, when the Lord was telling them there's going to get a king. Neither shall he multiply wives to himself. Just like verse, in verse 16, it said he shall not multiply horses to himself. Does that mean if a man had a horse and somebody stole that horse that he could never have another one for the rest of his life because the Bible said not to multiply horses? Well, of course not. It means for him not to have a bunch of them. The same thing in verse 17. Neither shall he multiply wives to himself. He's not to have a bunch of wives. They did throughout the Old Testament. Gideon had different, uh, more than one wife. David had several wives. Listen to this. Solomon had 700 and 300 concubines. And you know what the Bible calls him? The preacher. Lord in mercy, what if Solomon was alive nowadays? A man that was married to 700 women. Great day. Now I'm not condoning that. I'm not condoning that. I, I don't think he should have. I'm just saying the husband of one wife simply means married to one woman. If a man is married legally, scripturally, and physically to one woman, he meets this qualification. A man who is divorced, scripturally, for fornication, physically, not together, legally, in a courtroom, does not have a wife, and if he got married, he is the husband of one wife. You know what that means, the husband of one wife? That means there can only be one woman that can say, there's my husband. You get that? Now that's just as simple as and easy as one, two, three. When the gospel went out here in the New Test and the from the beginning of the New Testament time, when they went into those heathen countries, many of them had multiple wives. They'd have three or four wives living with them in the hut huts and in the jungles and in the villages and still do by the way on the mission field and so the Lord said all right if you're going to hold this office you've got to set up the right standard you've got to hold the right uh, have the right testimony and my general perfect plan of marriage was one man and one woman so if a man's going to represent me in the ministry he should only be married to one woman you remember the question I asked you back when we first started it said this if you're divorced from somebody, are they still your wife? Now, if a man's wife deserts him and he's called to preach, do you think that man should quit preaching if God's called him to preach? One preacher was talking about a preacher friend of his. His wife had deserted him and he was in the ministry and, and uh, he told another preacher about it and that preacher said, well, I guess he ought to, if he gets married again, he ought to start selling the insurance. Well, boy, I, just, I, I don't know about a guy like that says he's called to preach and thinks he could start selling insurance. How could a man lay the book down? How could a man say no to the calling of God that's without repentance? You say, well, he's disqualified. If he ain't married to two women, he's not. If he's the husband of one wife, he's not. You say, well, it don't mean that. It means one marriage. Why didn't it say that? Prove that it doesn't, prove that that's what it means. Show me in the Bible where it says a divorced man can't preach. Now, boy, I know you, some of you are stripping gears and you're a, you know, almost foaming at the mouth by now probably. You're probably, you're so mad you can't stand it, but listen to what I'm saying. Show me in the Bible where it says a man who's been divorced cannot preach. Let's see it. You ought to be able to show us. If you believe something that strong, it's not in there. If a man is divorced for fornication, physically, scripturally, physically, legally, he don't have a wife. And if that man gets married again, he is only married to one woman. And he is the husband of one wife. You say, well, I don't know, preacher. I heard somebody, and they was at this meeting, and they were talking about those priests back in Leviticus chapter 21, and this guy was telling us that 
uh, a man who marries a divorced woman can never be a preacher because God forbid the priest to do it back in Leviticus chapter 21. All right, let's look back at that scripture there in Leviticus chapter 21. He's talking about a priest. He, he said uh, um, that he couldn't defile himself except in for his sister, a virgin, that is nine to him, which hath had no husband. For her he may be defiled. He's talking about uh, defiling, touching dead bodies, and so on and so forth, and that type of thing, or something like that. They shall not make any baldness on their head. Does that apply to a New Testament preacher? Neither shall they shave off the corner of their beard. Does that apply to a New Testament preacher? They shall be holy unto, the, unto their God. They shall be holy unto their God. You reckon a New Old Testament priest would sit up at night and watch dirty movies on TV? Of course not. Thou, they shall not take a wife that is a whore or profane, neither shall they take a woman put away from their hu her husband, for he is holy unto his God. Now, you know what the Lord was showing there for that priest? He was showing his ideal. He was showing his ideal. And he's saying, this priest is representing me, and when he gets married, he can't take a whore, he can't take a profane, what about a man who marries a profane woman living in sin and then gets married and God calls him to preach? He married a profane woman. Are you going to tell him he can't never be a preacher because he married that woman when he was in sin and that woman wasn't right with God? What about this? He shall take a wife in her virginity. Does that? Do you mean to tell me that you think that nobody can be a preacher who didn't marry a virgin? Now you better think about that before you start jerking out one verse out of a chapter and trying to cram it out of context in 1 Timothy chapter 3. I'll tell you something, brother, that'll, that'll shock the daylights out of you when you think about it. These Old Testament priests are pictures of New Testament Christians. Every Christian is a priest in the New Testament. In the book of Hebrews, in the book of 1 Peter, Christians are the priest. And I'll tell you something else. In the book of Revelation, he's made us kings and priests. Every Christian is typified by that Old Testament priest. As a matter of fact, we can even go into the Holy of Holies, every Christian can, that only the high priest could go into in the Old Testament. So a man cannot really play, uh, be playing fair when he goes back to Leviticus 21 and say those are standards for a New Testament gospel preacher. It just won't work. Every New Testament Christian is a priest and pictured by the priesthood in the Old Testament. The priest couldn't even own any property. I, get, I bet some of you preachers own property. Does that disqualify you? Their property, their inheritance was of the Lord. Was every one of you preachers that hear these tapes, was your wife a virgin when you married her? Well, that's what it said she had to be. And if you're going to take those qualifications in Leviticus 21 and say they're for a New Testament preacher, oh boy, you're going to have a mess then, I tell you not just for preachers, for all Christians. So the term husband of one wife, God set up a new thing when he called that New Testament gospel preacher. And he's setting up his qualification for it here. And this man, these men here had run into a situation where that they had run into people who was in there, had three or four wives living with them. And brother, he told them, he said, no, if you're going to be the bishop, you can only be married to one. The verse forbids polygamy, friend. You just as well face it. The purpose of First Timothy chapter 3, the husband of one wife, was to forbid polygamy in the ministry. And just because we don't have any trouble with it here, we got good laws in the state of North Carolina that are based on the Word of God. But they didn't have them then, and they, didn't have, they still don't have them on the mission field. And don't get all wrapped up and think, North and South Carolina and East Tennessee and Kentucky and Virginia 
in northern Florida and Georgia are, is the only place in the world because we got good law. There's still thousands of men in this world that have multiple wives, and God said if a man's going to be a bishop, he can only be married to one. You say, well, I still believe it means only one marriage. You can only get married once. Really? What if, what if your wife dies? You say, oh, well, in that case, no, no, that ain't what you said. You said it means only married once. And then you're going to tell me if your wife dies. What you're saying is you can only be married once unless your wife dies. Now, boy, show me that in the Word of God. You know something? There's a lot of men that God could have used, but they were have been put on the shelf and pushed back and held down by people who told them they could never be in the ministry because of a previous marriage. And they are legally, scripturally divorced. They are married to one woman. Sometimes they have a home that's more spiritual and better than the one that have only been married once. And yet they're told they can never, ever even hold an office in some churches. I don't buy it, friend. And the book don't buy it. And any thinking Christian that prays about it won't buy it. It just won't work. Don't you think it's rather strange? I've heard people say, well, if, you, if a preacher's wife leaves him. I've heard even one fellow said that if a preacher's wife left him, I've heard of a fellow that said that, that if a preacher's wife left him, that meant he wasn't even called to preach because God wouldn't call a man to preach knowing his wife was going to leave him. Boy, that sure put John Wesley in a fix, I tell you. Can you believe John Wesley wasn't called to preach? Uh, John Wesley is one of the greatest men that's ever been on this earth since the Apostle Paul. And they said his wife was demon-possessed. And she used to drag him around the house by the hair of the head. And she'd stand up in his meetings and, and contradict what he was saying and stand up and say, John Wesley, you're a liar. You was out drunk last night. And, and Brother Wesley would preach, rode a horse something like 250,000 miles. She finally left him and old Brother Wesley said, I didn't run her off, and I ain't going to go fetch her. And went on for God. and done. Can you imagine somebody saying he's not called to preach? God wouldn't call to preach knowing. I mean, can you imagine that? Who wrote 15 hours a day when he was like 83 years old. And he's, it bothered him that he couldn't work more than about 12 or 14 hours a day when he was 86. He'd done a pretty good job, I tell you, for a man not called to preach. There are others who tell us that if a preacher's wife leaves him, he's either got to stay single the rest of his life or he's got to get out of the ministry. And i tell you something real weird. Don't you think it's very strange that in the very next chapter of the Bible, 1 Timothy chapter 4, that it said that spirits of demons, seducing spirits and doctrines of devils would be forbidden people to marry. You better pray about that. That's in the next chapter, friend. It's a doctrine of demons that forbids a man or a woman who is legally, physically, and scripturally single that to, never, to never get married again. And you know where that comes from? That comes from the Catholic Church. There is not one scripture in the Bible that says a man who is divorced for fornication would have two wives if he got married in the sight of God. His former wife is not his wife, and he therefore is the husband of one wife. I've heard preachers scream and say, yeah, if my wife didn't do what I told her to, I'd cram a dish rag in her mouth. Yeah. Now that, that sounds, I mean, that makes good preaching and it gets a lot of amens. But um, men who talk like that have good wives. You mark it down. They've got a good wife. They don't, they don't even know what it's like, most of them, uh, to have a wife that won't live with you and that won't submit to God or her husband. Um, so you'd do well just to ignore foolish statements like that. The Bible says husbands love your wife as Christ loved the church. I can't imagine Christ cramming a dish rag in the church's mouth. 
and that's not doing respectful at all uh, to your wife. I've heard people say, oh, if you believe that, you it don't mean one at a time, that husband and one wife. It don't mean, and they scream and holler and say, it don't mean one. Of course it don't. That ain't what it says. It says husband and one wife, period. Married to one woman. Married to one woman. It don't mean you can just get rid of one, get another, and get rid of one, and get another any time you want to. It, are you married to one woman? You qualify. Are you not married to one woman? You don't qualify. It's as simple as that. There can only be one woman that can say, there's my husband. That's clear and plain, and I challenge any man who hears these tapes to prove what I just said is wrong according to the Holy Scriptures. Let me quote again now from Dr. John R. Rice uh, in his book, Dr. Rice, here's my question, more questions I think it is, and he's discussing this uh, issue of a leader or office holder in a church, and he says this, quote, 1 Timothy 3, talking about uh, the husband of one wife, does not refer to a former mate. The, person who, the same requirement was for deacons and for bishops. That passage, I think, clearly has no reference to divorce or former wife or a former wife. Now, I think the same thing is true about one is it had a divorce. We do not want to act as if divorce is not bad. In certain cases, divorce is permissible in case of continued adultery or fornication. I would say that if David or Peter or Solomon or Mary Magdalene were in the church and showed evidence, which is convincing to everybody that they had honestly uh, repented or done whatever they you know, needed to do, they might be used like any other Christian. I do not believe in passing a rule that one who has ever been drunk or can, can never be a deacon or a preacher Likewise, I do not believe in passing a rule that everyone who has ever been divorced cannot be a deacon or a preacher. And my reason is very simple. There is no such rule in the Bible. Amen, Dr. Rice, you're right. There is no such rule in the Bible. You Listen, brother, this book covers every sin there is. When you have to start passing rules the Bible don't make, like nobody can sing in the choir and nobody can be an usher, or nobody can play the piano that's been divorced. You're just making up your own Bible, brother. They ain't nothing like that in the Word of God. And what, what some, some, some of you uh, folks need to do or listen to these tapes, we ought to be just to come clean with God, to confess this mess, and say, Dear God, I'm sorry for being so holier than, than, than thou, this holier-than-thou attitude. And God, I'm going to take what your Word says. If somebody abuses it, that's not my fault. I'm going to stand on the book. Some of the no remarriage teachers uh, like to use 1 Timothy chapter 3 to defend their position. But again, you've got to admit, this scripture does not mean what objectors make it, try to make it mean. Uh, what's taught here is against polygamy or bigamy, multiple wives. And some of the monks in the early church were so opposed to marriage, period, that they thought if a man's wife died and he remarried, he was the husband of two wives and was disqualified to be a church leader. Now, a study of all the facts in this, in this situation shows that divorce and remarriage for adultery is not even considered in 1 Timothy chapter 3. And to quote one great writer on this subject, as Christ allowed the right to another marriage after such a divorce, we cannot see how this Christ-given right disqualifies a man for the office of an elder or a deacon. In other words, what he's saying is, if Jesus told you it was right to do it, why would he say it was right to remarry after his divorce for fornication and then tell you put a penalty on you and tell you you couldn't preach if you did? Jesus would not tell you it's right to do something and then penalize you for doing right. We, we see uh, from the pulpit commentary, quote, It appears in the highest degree improbable that Paul laid down such a condition of no second marriage for the ministry, the priesthood, as it's called there in the commentary, picturing the ministry. There is nothing in his writings 
when treating expressly of second marriages to suggest the notion of there being anything disreputable in a second marriage and it would obviously cast a great slur upon second marriages if it were laid down as a principle that no one who had married twice was fit to be an episcopus. That means a pastor or a bishop. This would also apply to the second marriage in cases of divorce in 1 Corinthians 7, 27 and 28. All right, on the reverse side of this tape, we will take up our study in 1 Timothy chapter 3. And as we continue this thought in 1 Timothy 3, from side one of this tape, if a person who had been married twice was told they could never be a preacher, pastor, or, or a deacon, that would automatically make remarried people second-class Christians. And I want to tell you something. There's been a lot of Christians who have only been married once but live like the devil before they got saved and had a terrible life and not really much of a testimony since they've been saved. And they're treated many times with more Christian love and respect than a person who did do the right thing and went through a broken marriage and was humiliated in front of the community and held, stayed up at night with little kids being sick and carried them to the doctor and got out and got them a job and provided for those kids and worked hard and tried to do something for God and then they're looked down upon. That won't work, brother. That won't work. If a man is divorced from his former wife physically, scripturally, and spiritually, that marriage is dissolved they are no more married in the eyes of the state. They are no more married in the eyes of their family and friends. They are no more married in the eyes of God, according to his word, than that man does not have two living wives if he gets married again. He has one. I was in another state preaching a revival meeting. And, you know, you really learn a lot traveling around like that. I preached in about 45 different churches last year, 1989, and got to go to a lot of different states, and I've been to several foreign countries and met a lot of people, and I've just watched over 17 years of this thing, and I've just kind of observed, and I've dug up information from everywhere and, and put it all together and thought about this for years. I've thought about this for years. What I'm doing right now on these tapes it's just like uh, 10,000 pounds is being lifted off my shoulders as I make these tapes. It's been on my heart for so long. God just burned, burdened me down with this. And I, if, you know, I know some people won't like it, but if the Lord wants to use me to help a lot of brothers and sisters that's struggling and trying to do right and trying to go on and make something out of their life, then praise God, that's his business. I, you know, if the Lord wants to use me as a guinea pig and he allowed me to have this experience, uh, the things that I've been through to help somebody else, then to God be the glory, brother. You know, I want his will to be done in my life. But I met a, a brother in another state, and <clears throat> this is some time back, and I was talking to him after service, and he was so excited, he was just lit up. And he told me, he said, man, that is good preaching. He said, I appreciate that. Hallelujah. And he, he was just like a I mean, you know, he said, I want to preach so bad I can't stand it. He said, I, he said, I believe God's called me to preach, and I want to preach so bad I can taste it. And I said, well, amen, brother. Why don't you just go ahead and get with it? And he said, I can't. And I said, okay. Well, I didn't say anything. And we got to talking there, and he said, man, I, he said, I enjoyed that good preaching. That made me just want to get out and preach. He said, I want to preach so bad I can't stand it. And I said, well, brother, why don't you go preach? And he said, well, I can't. And I said, why? And he said, well, the, I'm not the husband of one wife. I've been married and divorced and, and remarried. He said, I've been married twice. And so I didn't say anything. I just kept my mouth shut because I never go to a person's church where the, and, and try to cause trouble. Or, or uh, you know, if someone asks me what I think, I'll tell them. But I never go to a man's church and try to stir up arguments. or try, I just go preach the Word of God and try to get some people saved and See, so let the pastor teach his people, and that's between him and God. 
And I'd never try to get someone to, re to rebel against their pastor or cause trouble in a church. So I didn't say anything. And he brought it up again. He said, I want to preach so bad I can't stand it, but I can't. And I said, um, why can't you, brother? And he said, well, because I've been divorced. And he said, I'm not, uh, you know, that husband one wife. He said, now, they're good here at the church. They let me work in the bus ministry. And I thought, yeah, I bet they do. And I bet your tithes are still welcome, too. And I bet they want you to be there every Sunday, too. And he said, yeah. And he said, uh, but I can't because I'm, you know, that husband of one wife. And his wife is standing there beside him, smiling. They both love the Lord and trying to do right. And he said he'd been through an unfortunate marriage and everything. And I said, well, let me ask you something, brother. How many wives do you have? And he looked at me so strange and said, and kind of glanced over at his wife and said, one? And I said, well, what's the problem then? And that fellow looked at me and his eyes got big around his quarters and he said, is that the way you look at it? And I said, I, di I didn't say anything. I just said, how many wives do you have? And he said, is that the way you see it? And I said, listen, you got one wife, ain't you? That other woman is not your wife. And I'm sorry it happened, and I, I wish it hadn't have, but she is no longer your wife in the eyes of the state, in the eyes of God, according to his word. She's not your wife. You've got one wife. And you know that fellow's wife punched him and kind of like she said, see there, that's what I've been trying to tell you. And that fellow looked like he had just got out of prison. I mean, the scales fell from his eyes, and a glory settled on his soul, and he said, praise the Lord. He said, I want to talk to you about this some more. And he went out of that church that night like a kid that had found a basket full of Reese cups. And I tell you what, you say, well, you should have never told him that. What did I tell him that was wrong? He is the husband of one wife. And I don't care what a Protestant pope says trying to go around telling independent Baptist churches who can preach and who can't. If God called that man to preach, you better leave him alone, friend. That's between him and God. And if he's married to one woman and his divorce was legitimate and he was deserted by his mate and his mate, former mate had sinned and broken that marriage, that man is just as free to remarry and in the eyes of the of the state of this of this state and most states that you live in and that I know anything about, he is and still is the husband of one wife. As Christ allowed the right to another marriage after a scriptural divorce, we cannot see how this Christ given right disqualifies a man for an office. 1 Corinthians 7, 15, Deuteronomy 24, we saw that after divorce in these cases, the remarried man was recognized by God and the Jewish and Greek courts as the husband of one wife. All right? You hear me? He was recognized by courts, a, a Jewish courts. He, would rec he was recognized by Greek courts. He was recognized by God Almighty and common sense as the husband of one wife. And if a man looks at you and says, there's a man who has been divorced and remarried, and he can't preach because he has, present tense, two wives, then you tell that guy, he, he needs to study his English grammar, brother, and study his Bible too. That man is the husband of one wife. And I'm, I'm certainly not trying to be uh, a smart addict with this, but I tell you, I think it's about time somebody told the truth. And I know I'll be, I'll be literally lied about, and I already have been, uh, and criticized terribly for what I believe. I've believed this for years and years and years, and I know that I'll be chewed up and spit out and misrepresented and everything, but it's just a blessing to be able to stand up and tell the truth about this thing. And you know, it's not real popular. I know one preacher who preached something contrary to what the brethren felt at a camp meeting, and he's no longer even allowed to preach at the camp meeting anymore. And uh, 
I, I just don't care about being in little cliques where you have to dot your I's just like everybody and cross your T's just like everybody or wear your hair just like everybody else or the same kind of shoes or you're just not accepted in the crowd. Brother, that's Phariseeism and God's not in a bunch of junk like that. And I tell you on these tapes here, and I restate my position over and over and over again, if a man has been divorced for fornication, his divorce was legitimate, recognized by the state in which he lives, by the Bible which he carries, a King James Bible, and he is physically, scripturally, and legally divorced, that man has no wife, and if he remarries, he is the husband of one wife. You say now, preacher, it's impossible for a man whose wife left him to take an unbiased view, and you're just trying to say this. No, I, I, could, I could turn that right around and say to you, yeah, it's impossible for a man whose wife has never left him to take an unbiased view. You can't, you can't use that for an excuse forever to dodge the facts that I've been presenting. I taught the very same thing on divorce and remarriage when I was married. I am a single man right now, and I was married. I am not married right now. And I taught the very same thing when I was married as I am when I'm single, so you can't say I'm on either side and I'm prejudiced. I've taught what the book said about it, and by the grace of God, will continue. You say, what does your future hold? I have no idea. That's up to the Lord. That's in his hand. I'm just happy trying to do what God wants me to do right now. And I've been trying to represent him and stay busy and tell people what he wants them to hear. And I'm taking an unbiased, unprejudiced look at the book. And I know I'm sticking my neck out. And I know I'll get called everything in the world and misrepresented for what I've said on these tapes. But... I say along with Martin Luther years and years and years ago when they asked him one time, they said, but the church fathers says this and the church fathers say that. He said to blazes with the church fathers, what saith the scripture? Amen. Boy, there's a certain blessing you get when you're just willing to stand for the Lord and be a blessing to other people. Now, just so that you'll make sure you get this, sometimes things have to be repeated over and over and over again before uh, before it really sinks in on you. And I know when I first got saved, I heard opposing views and ever views, and I went. To, I've been to all about all the camp meetings. I've read all the different views and books put out by different authors, and some of them are great men. And I'm not condemning these men at all. I think many of them love God and they've done more for God in this world than I'll ever do. And they they've been blessed and had good marriages, and I thank God for them and all of that. But nevertheless. I'm trying to tell you what the book says. And so far what we've learned is this. If a person has a legitimate divorce, the remarriage is legitimate. If a person had an illegitimate divorce, that means just for every cause or any reason they wanted to or they just got full of the devil and want to go get them another one, then it is adultery for them to remarry. However, after they are married... They should get right with God, stay in that marriage and make the best out of it and try to live right. For two wrongs, never make a right. We've studied that if you are scripturally fornication or desertion in 1 Corinthians 7.15, if you are physically apart and cut, if you are legally divorced, that you are not married. You are a single individual and when a person in that situation remarries, they do not have two living wives or two living husbands. The only way that a man can have two wives is be married to two women. The term husband of one wife means just exactly what it says. Married to one woman. You see, it's real simple if you just believe the book. There's no use complicating it and saying, well, what about this and what about that? And I know a man who, who ain't fit to preach because he left his wife and all that. No, no, we're not even talking about that. A man, uh, you say, well, does that mean a man can just divorce his wife and run around with another woman and then get him and still preach? No, because that blameless qualification took care of that. See? 
I read one book where it said a fella who um, had been divorced couldn't be blameless. Well, I tell you one thing, that guy sure had a lot to learn. I've, known, I've, I've counseled with hundreds of people down through the years that according to the scripture were blameless in a divorce. I didn't say perfect. I said blameless in the divorce. They begged. They pled. They'd done everything in the world to keep their mate from the divorcing them, and they couldn't stop it. But if a man just ups and says, well, I'm going to do my own thing and get rid of my wife and get me another one, then he disqualifies himself on the grounds of not being blameless. But if a man's wife deserts him and he's scripturally divorced and he remarries, he's not disqualified because he is the husband of one wife. And that goes for deacons, and that goes for Sunday school teachers, and that, go, that goes for, you say, well, i got a bunch of remarried people in my church, and I won't let them do nothing. Send them around, brother. We'll put them to work. we got kids need to be taught, and souls need to be won, and songs need to be sung, and, and buses need to be filled. And I tell you, I, I don't mind it a bit. I'll put them to work for the glory of God. And while, while the Pharisees sit around and complain and nitpick, They'll be trying to get some people saved and keep them out of hell. And that's what we need to be involved in is the work of the Lord. Now we're going to stop here on this tape and conclude our study in 1 Timothy chapter 3. We've come a long way now from Deuteronomy 24 to Matthew chapter 5, Matthew chapter 19, to Romans chapter 7, Mark chapter 10, Luke chapter 16, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, 1 Timothy chapter 3. We're going to stop now with our study on the scripture itself. I feel like I've repeated some of these things so many times you're getting tired of hearing it, but I'm just going to keep hammering on that same nail until it finally gets through folks' head that a bishop is chosen by the church and that church decides whether they want that man to be their pastor or not. And if that's who they decide they want to be their pastor, and in their eyes and the eyes of the, the way they pray about it and, and, and feel led of God, that man meets the qualification, it's none of nobody else's business. And God forbid that you go around in local churches trying to stir up trouble and steal church members and everything else because you can't go out and win somebody to God. You better be careful about that. We'll stop there with the study of the scripture. I'd be glad to sit down and discuss this with anybody, anytime. And if you can show me where I'm wrong, I'll make another set of tapes and apologize and tell them I was wrong by the grace of God. On our next tape, tape number four, we're going to give some closing comments, some illustration and conclusion of the study on marriage, divorce, and remarriage. We'll stop here and take up our study on tape number four.